We're on. Looks like uh, chair's a little small. Okay. Um, well, greetings. Um, got a lot of good questions <clears throat> regarding the homework. Uh, so that was great. One, I don't know if the student is here, but. 
pointed out about uh, the fifth problem um, in this homework set being the uh, equivalent to a Babylonian technique for computing square roots. N never heard of that one. Or I, I didn't, but it's not surprising. Um, so I've, I've learned, nobody's ever pointed that out before. The Babylonian invented this way of computing square roots. That, that's what this student had uh, pointed out to me. So I, that was kind of interesting. <laughs> So you never know what you're going to get in this class, you know. Um, anyway, that is the uh, first homework set. As I said, we'll have five or six um, during the the, the class, um, and pretty soon I will post a uh, project. It'll be a MATLAB-based project. Some of you have. Um, I don't think they're here, but if, especially Den student, are still trying to get used to MATLAB, or at least trying to. One student didn't have the MATLAB, and either have to get the student edition. So it'll take a little, a little bit more. But I think in the next few days we should all be pretty close up to speed. So I will assign a uh, project, but you'll have some time, you know, a couple of weeks, three weeks, whatever, to turn that. <laughs> turn that in so I want to make it nice and easy on us you know no uh, no stress no strain just a nice summer class here um, okay well let me let me get started last time we had talked about systems in fact we're, we're not quite finished but we're almost done with this with this area um, and 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 basically this this set of notes has it, it this is pretty much tools that you will need as as we go through filter design and uh, uh, sampling and and DTFTs and all that kind of good stuff. So these are all basic uh, tools that we'll need to build up. And and pretty much we have been looking in this set of notes different ways of characterizing linear shift invariant systems, or different ways of thinking about linear shift invariant systems, including very importantly in the set of notes are the uh, are is the uh, linear difference equation we talked about last time linear difference equation with constant coefficients and all kinds of different initial conditions, which would ensure that the system as characterized by that difference equation is uh, is linear shift invariant. One thing I hope that you've learned, not necessarily stable, but linear shift invariant. One thing that I, I hope that you've learned so far, the big, the big thing from here, the takeaway from all this, is that this difference equation, even if the b's and the a's are known, even if I tell you what they are, does not uniquely Characterized does not uniquely define a system. System response can be, or the system output from this difference equation can be different depending on initial conditions. So hopefully you've, you've gotten a sense of the role of initial conditions and how initial conditions uh, really characterize complete or give you the complete characterization of a system as described by a difference equation. So hopefully you learned the role of initial conditions and how important they are. So we talked about that last time. And then where I want to start off tonight, and I, I don't have a lot more to say, is the uh, discrete time Fourier transform. And um, discrete time Fourier transform, I don't know if you if you recall, when we started talking about this this particular section, we had mentioned that there were several ways of characterizing a linear shift invariant system, or yeah, an LSI system. And one way was linear difference equation with initial conditions. We've kind of talked about those and the role initial conditions play. Uh, impulse response, we even talked about that in the first set of, of lecture notes. And now we're going to discuss a little bit more detail the frequency response. We started on that last time. 
and uh, we'll wait till we talk about Z transforms to discuss system function. So, um, as we mentioned last time, first of all, we defined what the discrete time Fourier transform is, um, which is given by this. It is discrete in time, so that's that part is true. It uses, though, an infinite amount of data. Um, sums over all data from minus infinity to infinity. There is no restriction on x of n being uh, uh, periodic or not periodic. x of n could be anything. As such, oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. What is this? This is my pen, not the pen. Oh, there it is. This is, so x of n can be can be anything. As such, omega is continuous. Minus pi less than omega less than pi. Okay? Uh, and omega is continuous in that in that region. Now you might say, well, omega could be larger than pi. If I stick omega in here of two pi, I'd get an answer. You will, but what you will find is this is periodic. Periodic in omega. Uh, 2 pi. In other words, it, omega plus 2 pi gives you the same value as omega. That's a consequence of discrete system. That's a general property of discrete system. So in any case, this is the discrete time for a transform of some discrete time signal, x of n. We talked about some of its properties last time. And I give you some examples, some simple examples, but one to get you kind of start thinking about it including the discrete unit impulse, which, as we mentioned last time, the energy is focused in time but spread out in frequency. Uh, vice versa, the sine wave, energy is spread out in time but uh, focused in frequency to specific frequencies, namely the frequency of the sine wave. And this, too, is periodic. This is also periodic in with omega equal 2 pi, so it's periodic with omega 2 pi. And and actually, this is this is kind of a, a special case. It, it Strictly speaking, as we'll talk about a little bit later, the, 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 the DTFT is not absolutely summable, but people have defined the DTFT in terms of these generalized functions called the Dirac delta functions, which you've seen in, in linear systems the 300 course, 301 or 300. Um, so that is is the definition we will use. We'll be able to clean this up a little bit when we talk about the Z-transform. There will be a nice way of looking at these types of transforms, but that will come in a few moments. Um, so generally, if you have an infant uh, e to the j, oh, here's another thing. I'll, I'll just mention that. Here in this case, I should point out, x of n is periodic. What is the period of x of n? It's, um, it's omega naught, and, uh, which is 2 pi f naught. So it's uh, periodic in 2 pi over omega naught. So that would be the. This is the sine wave. X sub n equals e to the j omega naught n. So um, n plus 2 pi over omega naught, if you let n, n go to n plus 2 pi over omega naught, you will get the same result for e to the j omega naught n. So this is a case of a periodic function, but this is defined to be infinitely long. Minus infinity, less than n, less than infinity. When that is the case, so this is an inf it's been on forever, the sine wave. It didn't never started, never ended. Just went on forever. And in that case, here the the DTFT is discrete. It has these well defined spikes. Really, these are, are the Dirac delta function peaks. And uh, you can see you get one at omega naught, the frequency of the sine wave, and then just all the periodic cases, omega naught plus 2 pi plus 2 n pi, etc. However, for omega between minus pi and pi, in other words, this region right here, 
you just get the Dirac delta function evaluated at the sine wave frequency. So that's a good case of an, of an input signal, which is infinitely, which is the energy spread out over time, but yet the DTFT is focused at specific discrete frequencies. Uh, we talked about the right-sided geometric sequence, and for that one you can actually drive the, the DTFT, and if you plot it versus frequency, or if you plot the magnitude squared, you will find that depending on the sign of alpha, remember this is x of n, oops, x of n equal alpha to the n times u of n. If alpha is greater than zero, this is just a period, this is just a damp exponential, that's alpha greater than zero and less than one. If on the other hand, this is x of n, and that's n. If on the other hand, alpha is less than zero, minus one less than alpha less than zero, then you get something that oscillates. It'll be one, and then something, and then like this. And this oscillation, this oscillation of plus and minus, it tends to, to, to push the energy out. In fact, push the energy away from omega equals zero. So this is, whereas when, when alpha is positive, then you kind of have a low pass sort of response and you have a low pass sort of spectrum. But when, as we talked about last time, when alpha is negative and you get this, again, this, this um, oscillating sort of se damp sequence, but it's oscillating, that tends to push the energy more toward the highest frequency components, which in the digital world is plus or minus pi. Okay, so again, in the analog, in the continuous time world, high frequency could be anything, gigahertz, terahertz, but in the digital world, high frequency is pi, plus or minus, omega equals plus or minus pi. Uh, so we talked about that. Uh, we also defined the inverse DTFT. That is um, based on the uh, orthogonality of the complex sine waves. The, the inverse DTFT, as we mentioned last time, is an integral from minus pi to pi of the DTFT of x, capital X e to the j omega, times e to the j omega n d, d omega. So if you have x of n in the time domain, you can generate the DTFT, provided it exists. Uh, one caveat I mentioned last time, we'll come back to this in just a little bit. We talk about start talking about the Z transform. This DTFT doesn't necessarily exist for all x of n. And here was an example I used. Suppose x of n is a geometric sequence that blows up, doesn't go to zero. Well, then you can't do much with that. You can't take a DTFT. But another transform that we'll talk about tonight, the Z transform, will exist. Um, no, we only need to know x of e to the j omega over the, yeah. So, so if, if vice versa you have x of e to the j omega, the DTFT, then provided provided the, you know, the DTFT exists, then you can uh, recover x of n. And you only need to know x of e to the j omega from omega minus pi to pi. Again, think omega equal plus or minus, those are the highest frequencies, omega equal pi. So that's all you really need to know. Why? Because it's periodic outside of that. So now we consider our previous complex sine wave, but we start, okay, so we mentioned that last time. When I did this x of e to the j omega to be the sum of all these Dirac delta functions separated by 2 pi for the periodicity, and I use my handy dandy formula, indeed I do recover e to the j omega naught n, showing that they, those two are um, a pair, a um, transform pair. Okay, so that's, we mentioned that last time, and then we ended up going back to our linear shift invariant system using the uh, using the time domain representation, namely h can ball with x, and we discovered that when we take the frequency uh, DTFT of the output of the linear system, we get this very nice result. If y of n is equal to x can ball with h, in other words, the time domain representation in the discrete time frequency domain, 
then we would have that simply y is the product of the system frequency response. That's the response of the system to a complex sine wave times the DTFT of the input. So convolution in the time domain is equivalent to multiplication in the frequency domain, and the reverse is also true. So that's pretty much um, catches you up to speed on these notes. We're actually all, not all, pretty close to being through with these notes. Response of a linear shift invariant system to a complex sine wave tells us how it responds to any system. And to show that, what I did was suppose x of n looks like this. So I've written x of n as some complex amplitude, and I just wrote the complex amplitude like this, times e to the j omega n. So this is just a complex amplitude. And I'm using this notation. Oh. <laughs> Good luck getting in here, huh? Um, OK, so um, it's kind of interesting that I was driving over here. And uh, I actually drove here about 4.30. Now, let me tell you, if the Lakers had been in the NBA Finals, you don't get through, right? It, it takes you forever to get through. Hockey, not so much. It wasn't, wasn't that many. You know, traffic wasn't too bad. So anyway, uh, just a little commentary. Um, so in any case, suppose X of N, and we're going to write that complex amplitude, kind of in, anticipating what's going to happen. Um, then we know that the output is given by this, okay? So we've already proved that before, which is also a complex sine wave, scaled by the amplitude h of e to the j omega, okay? We've already shown that before. Now, for any arbitrary input, we can always represent the output using the inverse d, d t, f, t. So it looks like this. And, and so based on this inverse DTFT formula, the response of linear shift invariant to any input doesn't have to be a sine wave. It could be any input. It can be thought of as a superposition of the system response to all the individual complex sine waves between minus pi and pi. So this is a response. So this is saying that the response of, or, or rather the, the DTFT, or no, I'm sorry. The response of the system uh, to any arbitrary input can be thought of as a response to a superposition of complex sine waves appropriately weighted. And that's the weighting is the um, obviously the uh, frequency response of the system as well as the DTFT of the input. So um, the response of an LSI system to any input can be thought of as a superposition of system responses to individual complex sine waves over a continuum of frequency, generally. Okay? Not just 10 sine waves or 20 sine waves. To get, a, to get a better and better response, it's really over a continuum of sine waves. What is interesting is, however, you can, you can as an interesting note, you can take a um, you can take a uh, input, an arbitrary input, x of n, and compute the DTFT, right, and get x of e to the j omega. And then what you can do is take and say the system response is um, just well, h, suppose h is just 1. And then look at this. Look at, uh, let's call it y hat of n. Or better yet, we will say, let me let me call that x hat of n, okay, as a superposition of, of e to the j omega n times uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> look at x hat of n equals superposition. Let's call it k e to the j omega sub k times n, OK, times x of e to the j omega sub k. 
And what you will find is that at, where omega k is equal to, um, I don't know, I guess, well, you could do it like this, 2 pi over uh, 2, where omega sub k is 2 pi k over n, uh, which can be thought of as delta omega times k, where delta omega is 2 pi over n. So in other words, you, you keep breaking up the, the interval 0 to 2 pi, or if you want, minus pi to pi, into smaller and smaller frequency chunks, generating more and more of these sine waves, and add these together. What you will find is that this will approach, or it should approach, x of n as the number of frequency points you, or, or sine wave frequency, as n goes to infinity. And actually, you can typically get a pretty good approximation, even for not necessarily a large number of, of input sine waves. So just another, just another commentary. Um, let's see what else. Uh, in deriving the fundamental theorem for LSI systems, that was, that was by the way, as you recall, y equal x times h, we derived the shift properties. It turns out when we did, I don't know if you remember, when we did the, um, well, it was really from last time, but uh, when, when we did this, this transform, at some point, we had a transform involving x of n minus k. So that is really a shifted version of x of n time shifted by k samples. What we did, if you might remember, is we did a change of variables. We let n minus k be l. And when we did that, we found that the Fourier tra or the DTFT, sorry, of x of n minus k, when we did that change of variable, could be written as e to the minus j omega k times the DFT of s. So what that showed was that a shift, a time shift in the time domain, is equivalent to a phase shift in the, in the DTFT or frequency domain. We did that last time. So. Um, uh, 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 so that is, it turns out to be a fundamental prop, oops, sorry. That turns out to be a fundamental property of linear shift invariant systems. There's, there's, and I'll just kind of quickly go through some of the other properties. Namely that the DTFT of the time shift version is either my, a phase factor e the minus j omega k where k is the shift times the DTFT of x. Um, what else? Oh, here, with the inverse DTFT. This is kind of an interesting example. We'll come back to this at the, toward the end of the class. Um, suppose that our x, h of e to the j omega looks like this. It was defined to be basically a step function. Here's a plot, OK? It's 1 for omega less than omega naught, or in this region. And outside of this, it's exactly 0. That is called an ideal ideal low-pass filter. Why is it an ideal low-pass filter? It says it, it perfectly passes any frequency components in the input. So if you multiply this h times x, what happens is you will get, the result will be x uh, if the absolute value of omega is less than omega naught. Oops, omega, omega naught. Um, yeah omega naught, and it will be zero otherwise. So what this this ideal low pass quote filter does is it, if you have an input going into this, it will pass anything for frequency that as long as the frequency of the input is less than omega naught. If there's any frequency components in the input that are greater than omega naught, like if it was at some of the sine waves, some of the sine waves were outside, they'll be cut off. So it only passes the lower frequency, hence low pass filter. And by the way, it does it, it, do, it passes these lower frequency, it doesn't attenuate them, doesn't shift the phase, doesn't do anything to them. So that's why it's ideal. It ex all it does is just pass these low frequency and then cuts off everything else. Now, one question about, this is kind of a very unusual uh, uh, low pass filter. This is one of the few cases, well, I shouldn't say few, but this is a case where the low-pass filter, it, as it does define a linear shift invariant system, 
But it cannot, I repeat, cannot be described by a linear by a linear difference equation. No linear difference equation will will describe will define this. We'll see that later too as we as we talk more about these filters. But this this is a very unusual filter in that sense, although it's you know there's a lot of filters like that. Um, so that's one thing. Here's another thing that's kind of interesting about it. What the, well, given that, then you would ask, well, gee, I, if that's the, my gosh, that's intimidating. <laughs> if it can't be described by a difference equation, I, I have no idea what it is. But yeah, you can. Whenever you get cases like this, or you see things like this that can't be described, it's not in terms of e to the j omegas and all that, don't forget, you can always fall back on the inverse DDFT, okay? You can always fall back on the inverse DTFT. So if that's H, you can compute its impulse response. In fact, it's a very simple integral. The inverse DTFT is just minus, well, minus omega naught to omega naught e to the j omega n. That's it. And it turns out to equal a sync pulse, omega naught n over pi n. However, I should point out, this is for minus infinity less than n less than infinity. So what does that tell you? If the system, if the system is linear shift invariant, which it is, what does this tell you? That tells you that H is not causal, right? Because for an LSI system to be, to be causal, its impulse response must be zero for n less than zero. But this impulse response, well here I sketched a little picture of it, it looks something that looks like this, something like this. These are the sample points. This is, the solid line just the envelope. But these are the sample points would look like this. So the point is, is that this system is, um, is is uh, first of all, it's infinitely long. It just goes on like this. It's a sync pulse, and since it doesn't vanish for n less than zero, it is non-causal. Um, what about stability, for example? Um, well, strictly speaking, Strictly speaking, the if you if you take the absolute value of h of n, I guess they it's it's um, I think that actually blows up. So strictly speaking, it's it's not stable. As I recall, you can check me on that. But it but the summation of h of n that's fine. That's bounded. So this the sequence is called conditionally convergent. So bottom line is where I'm going with this is that it's a great filter. I mean it's ideal. It's perfect. You can't do any better than that if you want to do low pass filtering. But it's not realizable. It's not implementable. It's it's first of all it's, the impulse response is infinitely long. So how are you going to generate that? You say oh I can generate infinitely long impulse response using the difference equations. But no, you can't, because there's no difference equation who h of n behaves at. Difference equations, have, as we'll see later, have impulse responses that decay exponentially or blow up. But they, they don't do that. This is kind of like a, I don't know, like a 1 over n decaying to 0. So no difference equation has that behavior. So you really can't generate this, or, or you really couldn't implement a filter to do that. And besides, even if you could do all that, it's non-causal. So, you know, but H of n is non-causal. Also, it decays very slowly with time. In practice, we can only approximate it. But, and this is my point, we can approximate it. We can approximate this. I, I'll just write this down. It's kind of a little look ahead here. We can't, oops. We can approximate with delays, with very important delays. So I'll leave you to think about that. We'll come back to that later in the class. Okay. Um,
And and so a lot of these filters which aren't gener can't be generated by difference equations like these these filters uh, ideal low pass this is an ideal band pass you know it's it's or I guess you'd call it an ideal or an ideal notch filter in this case it does the opposite of the low pass it passes the higher frequency and gets rid of the lower one uh, for these again you can find h of n uh, h of n can be by the inverse dtft so anyway uh, enough about these filters. Here are some basic properties of the DTFT. I'll kind of highlight the more important ones. If x of n is real, then x of e to the j omega is the same thing as x of e to the minus j omega, but with a complex conjugate. Okay, and that implies, and I will let you you think about that. That that implies two things. Namely, one thing is that the magnitude of x of e to the j omega, let's call that a of omega, or a of e to the j omega, x of e to the j omega. What this, what this, what this uh, implies is that a of, of omega is equal to a of minus omega. Okay. So in other words, the magnitude frequency response or the magnitude dTFT of a real input is an even function of omega. On the other hand, the phase of x, you know, the phase of x, arctan of, of uh, imaginary over real, that is, call that phi of omega, that is an odd function. Phi of minus omega is equal to minus phi of omega. Both, oops, both of those follow directly from the complex conjugate symmetry. So, as an interesting, as a useful exercise for yourself, you should, you should. It's pretty simple to show that, and then there, and in turn to show that it implies this complex conjugate symmetry implies these two conditions. It, it's a good little exercise in complex arithmetic. That complex complex arithmetic primer I showed you before. So that's one property. Um, if x of n is complex, you can't really say too much. This is the only type of symmetry you have. But for instance, if x of n is real, then if we were to plot the magnitude of x of e to the j omega, again, you would find that it would be perfectly, here, I'll just do it goofy one, but it would be perfectly symmetric. Uh, if x of n is complex, you no longer have that complex conjugate symmetry. If you were to plot this, you know, who knows, you would have, you might have, uh, you know, something like that. I don't know, but it's not complex, it's it's not an even function. And in fact, you could see that with the, uh, if, if you look at the, um, Oh, I thought I thought I had that. Where did we do that? Oh, yeah. Take a look at the. Uh, oh, that was. Oops, sorry, that was way back there. Well, anyway, yeah. Take take a look at the complex sine wave. That's a complex input. Okay. Does it look uh, like it's an even function or symmetric about omega equals zero? No. You get a spike at omega naught. You don't get one at minus omega naught. Yeah, you get one at omega naught minus two pi, but you don't get the symmetry about omega equals zero. Why? Why would you expect it not to be symmetric? Because x of n is a complex signal in this case. So anyway, that's the uh, that's the deal there. Um, time and frequency shifting. We saw that before. A shift in time is just a phase factor, uh, vice versa. If you multiply by e to the j omega naught n in time, that's equivalent to a frequency shift in the frequency domain. Uh, time reversal, if you take the DTFT of a reverse version of your input, you get x of e to the minus j omega. That's These properties, by the way, are important. They come into play later when we talk about the DFTs. Um, and it's so on. You have, uh, this is uh, what is called Parseval's theorem. What it says is that if you compute the energy in the time domain, 
you get, and if you compute the energy in the frequency domain, now remember, the frequency domain, you actually have to do an integral, you sh you'll get the same result. There's no loss of energy or anything by using this transform. Uh, we've already discussed convolution theorem. If you have a convolution in the time domain, that gives you, that gives rise to being a product in the frequency domain. Vice versa, if you have a product in the time domain, you end up with a convolution in the frequency domain. So there's a duality. It's just that the convolution in the frequency domain, again, since these frequencies are continuous, is actually an integral over minus pi to pi. This is a very important property that we will come back to when we discuss windowing and the DFT. So just kind of keep that one in mind. Uh, Okay, and then that, that was pretty much the end of it, except that, sure. Uh, suppose uh, my, the filter that we discussed, low-pass filter, right. it's an ideal low-pass filter. It's, uh, it's MSI in the uh, frequency domain. Right. So the impulse response is non-constant in the time domain. Right, right. So in general, is it, is it, is it the same case in all for all the functions? Suppose if a uh, function is... Uh, You mean in general? Yes. Um, well, no, no. Uh, like that example, I think if I if I think I understand. Could you please repeat the question? Yes, that that's a very good point. Who said that? No, that that's a good point. Um, I will repeat the question, but before I. Let me find this page. So, well, now, okay, yeah, I will repeat what I think your question was. Your question was, if you have a DTFT in the frequency domain, does it all, is it always non-causal in the time domain? No, if the DTFT is uh, linear time invariant in the frequency domain, is it always non-causal in the time domain? If, if, if the DTFT is uh, linear? Linear time invariant. Okay, time invariant. Uh, ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, now, now nobody will ask why. <laughs> uh, uh, if the frequency response is uh, uh, LTI. Okay, linear shift invariant. And is it necessary that the uh, the impulse response is uh, non-causal? No. Um, I mean, it could be non-causal, but it could be causal. Like that example that that we showed here. Here we had a causal, like if that were the impulse response, that would be a causal response. And and for that case, the DTFT, you know, is is well defined. So if if that were your DTFT, it would actually correspond to a causal signal. So I just happened to pick an example that that was. Um, you know, that ideal low pass, which, which ended up being non-causal. Well, yeah, you can have causal sequences. Now, the, the, the one thing, though, is, and I should point this out, is that if I give, and you'll see this later, if I give you the frequency response, okay, think about it like that. Can you tell, without doing the inverse DTFT, can you tell if the system is, is uh, you know, if the inverse DTFT is causal or not? And it's hard to do that with the uh, with the DTFT, but we'll talk about the Z transform. You'll be able to see how you can tell more things about that. So uh, let me conclude. I was hoping to get further along last time, but that's all right. So I will conclude with um, re-examining that linear difference equation. Remember, we had a linear difference equation. What what I want to point out is that. When I talked about linear difference equations, I give you some very simple examples, very simple examples, where I was deriving the response you know, of the difference equation. Like if you recall, y of n equals x of n plus a times y of n minus 1. That was an example we considered earlier with x of n equal delta of n. 
And we actually computed, and oh, I'm sorry, and y of minus 1 equals 0, for example. And we ended up actually computing what, what y of n was. Even, even for more general cases, we ended up with, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just showing this in case, so you can kind of remember if I can find it. We actually even considered more general cases. Uh, well, yeah, this case is here. Um, let's see. Yeah, we even considered more general cases where de we derive the time response by going through all these recursions, sample by sample by sample. The problem is that that's, that's OK, but that's, that's not going to give you much insight into y of n. At some point, what you're going to do is say, you know what? I'll just run it on the MATLAB and see what that looks like. But with these transform techniques, the first being the DTFT, now, and using the shift property, now you have another way of, of computing the uh, responses of these systems in the time domain, the responses of these linear difference equations. Because what you can do is you can take, in this case, the DTFT at both sides. Now you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, you have n minus k, but we know how to do those n minus k's, right? And we know that the DTFT is linear, so I can take the DTFT of both sides of my difference equation, and because of the linearity, I can take the DTFT inside the sum, and what is the DTFT of y of n minus k? Well, that's just equal to dt, as we know, y of n minus k, or x of n minus k is just e to the minus j omega k times y of e to the j omega. So guess what? All these terms, when you go to the frequency domain, which are these time shifts, they're all of e to the minus j omega k times a constant term, namely the dtft of y. So what that means is that you can take the y of e to the j omega, pull it outside, and you're just left with this like polynomial in e to the j minus j make a k. Same thing on the side x. And then guess what? You know that if it's a linear shift invariant system by our theorem, our handy dandy theorem we showed, we know that this is true, right? Equal to x of, I'm sorry, x times h for LSI system, so assuming it is an LSI system, which means assuming that the initial condition is chosen appropriately, we have this little nice result. y is equal to x times the ratio. I just divide it through. Everything's a polynomial now. There's no more time shifts. So now you can just simply divide this side through by that side, and you get this. And recalling that's equal to x times h, what it implies is that h is equal to this ratio. And many times that, you know, of course, depending on the order of the system, this many times is much more simply. You can compute h of n by the inverse dtft, see? Or, as we'll talk about in just a moment, the um, of h, or the inverse C transform. Turns out that most of the systems we will deal with in this course have frequency responses of this form, but not all. In fact, I just showed you an example which didn't have a frequency response of that form. But if it's a difference equation, it will have a frequency response of this form. Very, very, very nice property. And that's why I said earlier that example I give you before with the ideal low pass h cannot be put into this form. So that is pretty much all I want to say about the DTFT, because I have a much better deal for you in terms of another transform, uh, the Z transform. Now, before I talk about it, I want to mention something to you. Uh, I have this example. Yes. Okay, I, I want to mention something to you, and I kind of alluded to it a second ago. What I want to mention is, let me get my writing thing here. So, 
So let me point an interesting fact out. DTFT. Let me expand on something I said earlier. X of e to the j omega equals summation n. X of n e to the minus j omega n. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, example, the first example. X of n equals a to the n times u of n and the magnitude of a less than 1. We've already solved that one. We have this uh, equals 2, 1 over 1 minus a e to the minus j omega. Okay? So that was that example. Let me give you another example. Example 2. And I want you to tell me what the DTFT is. a to the n times u of n. Magnitude of a is greater than 1. I want you to tell me what x is, x of e to the j omega. Well, you might be inclined to write down, oh, well, that's just 1 minus, wait a minute, it doesn't even exist, right? This does not exist. So actually, does not exist for this case. Now, I show you this, it's an obvious comment. Um, I show you this because x of e to the j omega does not exist, like like if, if a were 2, say a equals 2, then that would be x of n equals 2 to the n times u of n. So for these cases, dtft does not exist, but, but z transform does exist, okay? The Z transform does exist. So I just kind of, I meant to point that out at the end of the last session, but we didn't have, we had, didn't have enough time. So that's why the Z transform is very, very important. It basically, it, well, how do I put this? The, the DTFP is a special case of the Z transform. The Z transform is much more general. And it exists for a much wider class of inputs. Not all inputs. There are certain inputs where the Z-transform doesn't exist. That is true. But it's, it exists for a much wider class of inputs. And when it does exist, you can tell a lot about the class of inputs by looking at the form of the Z-transform and looking at something, as we will discuss, called the region of convergence. So. Let's talk about this interesting thing called the Z-transform. I have some notes that I want to make sure I point out. Um, let's see. Bear with me. Okay. Okay, so um, the Z-transform. What is this, this magic thing called the Z-transform? Actually, it's very simple. It's, uh, it's just x of z, where z, which looks like this, n, x of it, so it kind of looks like the dtft, z to the minus n. That's it. That's the z transform. Done. And um, notice that if, if z, special case, is equal to e to the j omega, then guess what? x of z goes back to our dtft, see? Okay, so the z transform includes as a special case the, the uh, dtft. But in the most general case, z is complex. Z is complex. So in other words, the dtft was just defined, if, if you look at it like this, where z is equal to e to the j omega. What is z of e to the j omega? That is, if you plot the real part of z, we'll be doing that a lot, and the imaginary part of z, if you draw a unit circle. Okay, that circle, and you call that angle omega. This is this unit circle, and it has a radius 1, unity. This is all the points traced out by e to the j omega for minus pi less than or equal to omega less than pi, okay? So in other words, as omega, think of it as an angle now, as it traverses from, from 0 to 
pi to 2 pi, or you can think of this as, uh, if you want, from um, minus pi to pi, same thing. This this uh, z, defined as z equal e to the j, traces out a circle, a unit circle. Okay, But that's just a small part of the complex plane. Generally, the z transform is defined for all points in the complex plane, at least all points in the complex plane, z, where the transform exists. So the z transform is a big generalization of the DTFT. It basically extends the DTFT off of the unit circle in the complex plane. So it's a, it's a very, very powerful uh, transform. And just by looking at the transform, figuring out where does the z transform, given a sequence, where does the z transform exist? Where doesn't it exist? In other words, what values in the z plane is the z transform perfectly well defined, summable, all that kind of stuff? What points in the z plane does the transform blow up? That tells you a lot about the input sequences you're dealing with. So it's 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 a very very powerful uh, transform. Now um, another way to look at it is look at it like this. We already looked at the KC equal e to the j omega. Let's generalize that now to the entire complex plane, where z is equal to r times e to the j omega, where r is a real number, zero less than r less than infinity. Okay, and omega again is between minus pi and pi. In that case, x of z is that's more general. You can write it as uh, summation x of n times r to the minus n times e to the minus j omega n. So this is another way. I'm just repeating. Um, my eyes, I can't see that so well. So I write bigger, except I didn't write that much bigger. But in any case, here you can clearly see where the z transform does generalize the uh, DTFT by introducing this factor here, which makes it, which extends the z transform to the entire complex plane. Okay, so that is the Z transform. Now, um, if you will give me a, uh, I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, all right, well, this is sort of, is this jump, do I need to talk, say this? I don't know. Um, Well, anyway, um, so that that is the Z transform. That's the definition. Now, when you talk about the Z transform, there's a very, very important concept that you have to understand. And the concept is called the ROC, or region of convergence. What is the ROC? Well, given it, you have to give, give yourself a sequence. Every sequence has its own region of convergence. And it's pretty simple, actually. The region of convergence of a given sequence x is just all the points in the complex plane such that the z transform converges in absolute value. Okay, that's that's all it is. But that's a very important concept, um, and it's it's absolutely critical that you know what the the uh, region of convergence is if you want to uniquely determine the sequence x of n given its c transform. So you can tell a lot about these sequences just by looking at the region of convergence as well as x of z. So again, very important concept. It's the set of all z in the complex plane such that the z transform converges in absolute value. Okay, that is what the z, or that's what the region of convergence is. If, if you want to do what I did earlier, write z, the polar representation of any complex number I can write is r e to the j omega, then that condition is equivalent to being that the summation of absolute value of x of n times r to the minus n is less than infinity. That's the region of convergence. Uh, and and that, that kind of tells you something about the power of the z transform tells you something about the power of the z transform okay 
Let me take an example. I think you might have seen this example. In fact, we just had the example. x of n is equal to 2 to the n times u of n. Let's look at that example again. Now, what was the DTFT? DTFT doesn't exist. No, it doesn't work. Ah, but what about the z-transform? What about the z-transform? Well, if you look at the z-transform, uh, the region of convergence is the set of R, basically, such or the set of z such that um, you know the z transform converges absolutely. Well, let's let's take a look at this guy. Summation x of z. So the DTFT we're done with that. We know that doesn't work. But the z transform zero to infinity, and I'll come back to this example again, so you'll see it several times. I might as well tell you, is what was it again? 2 to the n times z to the minus n. I believe that was it. I can write that as a summation 2 over z all raised to the power n, right? 2 over z raised to the power n. That's the z transform. Hmm, interesting. So this, like the DTFT, it doesn't converge. Yeah, it does converge in in a given region. What is that region? Well, if you look at it, you start to realize, well, for this thing to converge, this this had better be, call that t equals 2 over z. We'd better have for convergence, for convergence, uh, we need um, for convergence, the magnitude of t equal the magnitude of 2 over z better be less than 1, right? Well, guess what? That's, uh, that defines the region of convergence. That implies that, yes, the z transform does exist, and its ROC of this sequence is the set of all z, all all points in the complex plane with magnitude uh, greater than 2. So if you look at this, I'm sorry about all this scratching, but if you look at this, go ahead and plot the real of z and the imaginary of z and draw a circle of radius 2, not 1, but 2, now you can see the problem. In, in the DTFT, it's the same thing as the Z-transform, but just evaluated on the unit circle, OK? And we know that doesn't, DTFT doesn't exist. But if you restrict yourself to points in the Z-plane, OK, in this hatch region that lie greater than the magnitude of 2, everything's fine. The Z-transform Z uh, converges. So the region of convergence for this 2 to the So the good news, the interesting news is that the z-transform of this thing where the DTFT doesn't exist, z-transform's fine, and it has this region of convergence. And you can see, given that the unit circle was like here, you can see the DTFT wasn't even close to converging, OK? Wasn't even close. When you extended the transform to the entire complex plane, changes everything, OK? Changes everything. So that's why the z-transform is so powerful. And I almost forgot to mention, just like the DTFT, there is an inverse z-transform. Strictly speaking, it's defined in terms of an integral, actually a complex closed contour integral in the complex plane. That's how x of n is defined. Now, it turns out for this class, um, since complex analysis wasn't really a requirement, if some of you have had it, that's great. But you really don't need it, because for the inverse C transform, um, we will look at some different ways. But but you may ask yourself, so this this is any this is a contour integration over any closed contour in the z in the complex plane. Any closed contour 
enclosing the origin and lying totally within the region of convergence. So that's, that's where the region of convergence comes back into play in terms of the inverse C transform. We'll come back to the inverse C transform later. We won't do it this way because that, that re requires some complex analysis. We'll use some uh, other tricks as we'll talk about. But anyway, that is the Z transform, and that's the region of convergence. The region of convergence, I'm telling you right now, it is absolutely critical. If you don't know the region of convergence, as you'll see in just a moment, you don't know anything about this, the, uh, the Z transform. Okay, so that is absolutely critical. And the other thing that's interesting is that there are a whole bunch of sequences where the DTFT doesn't converge. Z transform does in the appropriate region of convergence. So um, that is what I want to say. I just want to make sure. Okay. Blah 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 blah. blah. Okay. I guess that's all I wanted to say about that. Okay. We move on. I have some more properties of Z transforms. Uh, we have a few and a lot of examples to go through. Actually, I'll, I'll be, be honest with you. On the Z-transform, the best way to understand it, I mean, to really see what's going on. You, you've heard this theory, and that's nice. But to really understand it is through some, some examples that we'll go through. But I'll also try to tell you the more general picture to give you some of its properties. OK. So once again, I repeat again, we'll repeat all these concepts several times. Given a sequence, here's the Z transform, OK, as I defined before. And here is the region of convergence. Very, very critical. Now, um, recall that we have so far characterized, oh yeah, I, I do want to digress here, just, just for a minute, just briefly. Recall that we have so far characterized linear shift invariants that we want to characterize them by these different ways. One was something called the linear difference equation. We did that. One technique of characterizing them was through the impulse response. We did that. Another way of characterizing uh, linear shift invariant systems is through the frequency response. We did that. There was yet a fourth way. I call the system function. So I just want to let you know what that is right off the bat. The system function, it's pretty simple. It's just the Z transform of the impulse response. So the frequency response is the DTFT of the impulse response. The system function, just terminology, is the Z transform of the impulse response. And as, again, as we say, and I've said this several times, we can tell a heck of a lot about a system by its system function. We can tell if it's stable, if it's not stable, if it's causal, if it's not causal, etc., etc. OK, now, going back to the Z transform, I would like to look at a couple of examples. As I said, the best way to learn this is through some simple examples, and you can kind of get a better idea of what's going on. And in these examples, we will deal with geometric sequences in these examples. In fact, in these two examples. But I just want to show you the role of uh, why the region of convergence is important. So the first example is a right-sided geometric sequence. It's our old friend alpha to the n times u of n. OK, it's our old friend alpha to the n times u of n. And uh, what is the z transform of that? Well, it's. Uh, but by the way, all these C trans the simple ones you can just do by, or, well, yeah, the simple ones you can do is as long as they're like geometric. Certainly, the simple ones you can do by uh, using this geometric sum formula. Remember that, n equals zero to infinity, t to the n is equal to one over one minus t, provided that t magnitude is less than 1. That's, that's the so-called geometric formula, or derived from that. Anyway, using that, uh, in fact, if you let t, in this case, equal alpha times the inverse, you end up very quickly using the geometric sum formula. This result for the z transform. Okay, And if you notice, in the z transform, 1 over 1 minus alpha z inverse, it does have a pole. Okay, a pole at z equals alpha. In other words, when z is equal to alpha, the denominator goes to zero. 
uh, NC equal alpha. Uh, turns out that it also, I can rewrite it, we'll come back to this a little bit later, but it doesn't hurt to look ahead a little bit. I can write it like this. So not only does it have a pole, it's equal alpha, but a pole, I mean it, where it blows up, it's E equals alpha, the denominator goes to zero. It also has a zero at Z equals zero. Now some Z transforms, some systems won't, won't have zeros at Z equals zero. But this particular one does, okay? It has a zero at Z equals zero, it's just an aside, okay? So that is the Z transform. Um, another note, x of z is a rational function of z. Turns out that x of z is always a rational function of z if x of n is a linear combination of complex geometric sequences, okay? And it turns out, or if x of n is derived from, from a linear difference equation. Now, I should tell you, from now on in the class, most of the systems, if not all, are going to be either geometric sequence driven or really the output of a linear difference equation. So from now on, you're going to see x of z's or h of z's, depending if we're doing impulse response z transforms or just a signal z transform. Most of the z transform, if not all, that will be functions of z or z inverse, okay? So they will be, in fact, they will be rational functions of z or z inverse. This is a rational function. It's a polynomial in z divided into another polynomial in z. Okay, so most, from now on, if not all of the z transforms will be rational functions of z, okay? Okay, now the second question, there are really two questions you asked. What is the z transform, but the, more importantly, what is its region of convergence? And based on the example I showed you just a moment ago, it's pretty simple to see that the region of convergence of this transform is all the points in the complex plane whose magnitude is greater than the magnitude of alpha. I'm, I'm allowing alpha here. Remember, x of n is equal to alpha to the n times u of n. I'm allowing that alpha could be complex, okay? But whether it's complex or not, the region of convergence is everything exterior to the circle, just like I drew before, where the circle in general is of radius magnitude of alpha, okay? So that is the, um, that is the region of convergence. And if you notice, uh, there, this pole, it's equal alpha, it's right on the boundary of this, of this, um, it's, this pole is equal alpha. It's right on the boundary of the region of convergence. Does the region of convergence include that pole, you may ask, since it's on the boundary? The answer is no. The region of convergence is the absolute value of z strictly greater than alpha. If it's not strictly greater than, then this, this series, this geometric series, doesn't converge. It'll be just a sum of a bunch of ones. So the region, if there are any poles, anything like that, the region of convergence cannot include those. They can be on the boundary, but they will not lie inside the region of convergence. So that is the region of convergence. Turns out that the region of convergence for right-sided geometric sequences or sums of right-sided geometric sequences uh, is always exterior to a circle. And again, I will come back to that point in just a moment. Oh, in fact, I can mention it now. In fact, in fact I will do that. Um, oh, yeah. Um, bounds. Oh, yeah. I, I guess I should, yeah, I'll come back then in a second. Okay, so that is a uh, comment on this. Turns out that poles always found, okay, question two. Oh, well, this is kind of, does x of z makes, in other words, we derived x of z like this. We derived its region of convergence, which was everything exterior to a circle. 
A question is, does it, does this just forget about the region of convergence? Does this x of z does it make sense outside of its region of convergence? And the answer is, of course, it makes. I mean, you. What I mean by does it make sense? Can you evaluate x of z just given by this function for z values outside of the region of convergence inside that circle or inside the region of convergence? And the answer is yes. You can evaluate it anywhere. You get a nice finite number for any complex Z, except when Z is equal to alpha. Um, so definitely X of Z, just by itself, is, design, is defined for points Z not in the region of convergence. But that's neither here nor there. The point is the Z transform, you have to specify the region of convergence. And to show you why that region of convergence with this simple example is so important, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a different sequence, OK? And I will compute this sequence as X of its, its Z transform and its region of convergence. So let's look at this is going to be a kind of an opposite example, a left-sided sequence, OK? And our left-sided sequence will look like, I'll write it out in terms of the step functions, uh, minus alpha to the n times u of minus n minus 1. That will be this sequence. That is indeed left-sided. It's geometric, all right, but uh, that's what it is. And uh, we will assume, assume for this example, that the magnitude of alpha is less than 1, OK? And you say, OK, great, then it's stable. Eh, 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 it's not stable. This left-sided sequence, if the right-sided sequence was stable, alpha to the n times u, the left-sided sequence is not stable if alpha is less than 1. Not stable times x not, not stable. OK, why is it not stable? Because n here is only negative. So what you're doing is computing really, this is really equal to, equal to minus alpha to the minus absolute value of n, see? Minus absolute value of n. Or equal to minus 1 over alpha to the magnitude value of n. So you can see that if alpha, if the magnitude of alpha is less than 1, then 1 over alpha is greater than 1. This thing's just going to blow up, OK? So assuming this means that the um, sequence itself is not stable. But that doesn't, that doesn't stop us in terms of the Z-transform, as we see. We just got to determine the appropriate region of convergence. But I'm going to show you something that will surprise you with this. Look, this is the Z-transform. How do I compute it? Well, you compute it like you did before, except that now you're going from n equal minus infinity to minus 1 times alpha over z to the n. But um, what I would do, uh, you can still use the geometric sum formula. It's that you could do this, make l equal to minus n. So you can do these tricks. And this becomes a sum from l equal infinity to 1 of alpha over z to the minus l, right? And since it's just a sum going, I mean, you can write it this way, or this is the same thing as L equal 1 to infinity of alpha over Z to the minus L, or summation L equal 1 to infinity of Z over alpha to the Lth power, see? So you can manipulate these. As, as, as long, if they're geometric, you can always manipulate them into uh, series that are geometric series based with positive indices. So anyway, so this goes from 1 to infinity. I, um, yeah, so I, I, well, there is a minus sign, but I just showed you that part. And so, and in fact, I even went a step further and converted this minus, this x of n, x of z, rather, I should say, into a sum that goes from 0 to infinity. I just removed the first term, that's what this one is doing. So anyway, you can check through this. And what is this? Well, now you've got it into a form where you can use the handy dandy uh, geometric sequence formula. So that's going to be 1 over 1 minus uh, z over alpha. That's pretty cool. One minus, And it's going to be 1 minus that. 
So I've got that, z over alpha. I'm going to combine everything together, and guess what I get for x of z after I've simplified everything? 1 over 1 minus alpha z inverse. Is that familiar to you? You remember this? What gave us 1 over 1 minus alpha z inverse? It turns out that geometric sequence, right-sided, give you the same result. Okay, The right-sided geometric sequence, right here, here it is, also gave us 1 over 1 minus alpha c inverse. See? Kind of interesting. So we have two sequences. They both have the same z transform. Are they different sequence? Different is night and day. One is right-sided. One is left-sided, minus alpha to the n times u of minus n minus 1. They're just totally different sequence. They're not related at all, but yet they have the same z-transform. So what is different in these two sequences? What is different is the region of convergence. For this case, we have to have that z over the magnitude of z. For this thing to converge, the magnitude of z over alpha has to be less than 1 which implies that the magnitude of z is less than the magnitude of alpha. So this is everything interior to a circle. So the geometric right-sided sequence, exterior. The, this uh, left-sided geometric sequence, interior. Okay. So is the region of convergence important? You bet. It defines what the sequence is. Without the region of convergence, the z-transform is not unique. Two different sequences give you the same z-transform. What distinguishes the two are the region of convergence. So the fact that the z-transform admits more sequences, much more, than the DTFT, that's the good news. The Well, not bad news, but the other part of that, though, is that you have to carry along this region of convergence. You might call it baggage. I, don't call it that because it tells us a lot about the sequences. So it's Z transform plus ROC that determines your uniqueness of the Z transform. So if on an exam I give you an, uh, a Z transform and I ask you to determine the inverse, what is the sequence X of N corresponding to that, and that's all I tell you, can't do it. Write down not, not specified can't do that because you need the region of convergence. Um, for the left-sided unstable, remember we picked alpha less than 1 a geometric sequence. We see that from above, the region of convergence is everything interior to the circle, which is everything interior. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'm sorry. I just said that. <laughs> now, you can tell. Just looking at this region of convergence, you can tell if the sequence is stable or not. Interesting, huh? Looking at, for the right side, it's equal. Looking at this region, I can tell you if the sequence is stable or not. Just looking at that, that's all I need to know. Just looking at that. How do I do that? Where's the magic? Nothing up my sleeves. Hell, I don't even have sleeves. How do I determine? Is there something magic? No. I'll come back to that, though. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so in any case, that is that. Let me, let me give you another example, just for the heck of it. We might as well do this example. Um, let me give you an example while we're here at the point. A, I'm going to do this, alpha to the n. I'm, this is another right-sided sequence, but I'm going to give you a sum of two sequences. Give you something to think about, okay? And what is x of z? Well, since the z transform is strictly linear, then we can just use the results we derived before. It's going to be something like this. It's, in fact, it's going to be summation x of n, z to the minus n, n is going from 0 to infinity. This is the first example. And what are you going to get? Well, from the first thing, you're going to get a over 1 minus alpha z inverse plus b over 1 minus beta z inverse. So you say, hell, this is <laughs> hell, this is easy. We can write these things. Once I knew just that one formula, I can do anything. Oh, I could do a million of them. Wait a minute. 
I'm going to ask you, you know I'm going to ask you, you know it's coming, what is, okay, you could do that. Now I'm going to ask you, what is the region of convergence, see? What is the region of convergence? Well, that, think a little bit more on that. Um, okay, okay. Let's, let's go back. Let's look at our Z transform again. And let's look at equal to A. Let's write it out in a little bit more detail. N equals 0 to infinity of um, alpha divided by Z to the N, right? Plus B times summation N equals 0 to infinity of beta over Z to the N, okay? So here's my question. What, first of all, what is the region of convergence? It's the set of Z in the complex plane for which X of N, or X of Z converges. Absolutely, okay, absolutely. So what would it be here for this case? Well, uh, for this sum, I can tell you, well, for this sum to converge, we would want magnitude of alpha, I'm sorry, magnitude of Z greater than the magnitude of alpha. For this sum to converge, we would need the magnitude of Z greater than the magnitude of beta. Okay, so we know that. So pick one. The region of convergence would be this. Or maybe it'd be that. Could be either one of these. No, it couldn't. It's only one. It's one region of convergence for any sequence. There's no ambiguity. And again, keep in mind, it's the region of the complex one for which the Z transform converges. So let me let me give you an example here. Suppose so that's a very interesting example. Suppose, just for the heck of it, alpha equals, let's say, 2, and beta equals 3. Okay? Well, uh, then what is the region of convergence? Well, we have two possibilities here. Z is greater than alpha. So you could say Z greater than 2. Question mark? Is that the region of convergence? No. Because if z were greater than 2, z could certainly be 2.5. Hello, this term will diverge. So this is eh, not the region of convergence. What about z greater than 3? Yeah, now everything's cool. See, that, that condition is certainly, certainly satisfied because Two is three is greater than two here, so z. Yep, that's satisfied. Check that condition is certainly satisfied. Check so that is the right answer, namely magnitude of z in this case greater than beta, magnitude of beta. Okay. In general, for the case of two sequences, right-sided sequences of this form, the region of convergence. Oops, where is it? region of convergence is the set of all z greater than the max of either the magnitude of alpha or the magnitude of beta. Okay? I'm, I'm, I apologize, it's a little bit messy, but hopefully you can read that. If not, send me an email. Um, but anyway, and of course this is, by the way, all these notes are scanned too if you want to Look at them, they're all scanned on the DEN website, so I will make sure this is all scanned. Um, so this is, this is a very interesting case. It's, it's a, a generalization slightly of the cases we were looking at before, where now we have multiple, uh, uh, multiple um, geometric sequences, all additive, and now it's, it's interesting in this case. Now we'll generalize that in just a couple of moments, but in any case, I... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What if we had a sum of a right side sequence and a left side sequence? I don't like that. Don't, lust don't do that. No, we could do that. I'll show you that example in a second. Well, in, in, after the break. But yeah, very good question. Example x of n oops, sorry, is equal to alpha to the n u of n plus, I don't know, let's say beta 
to the n times u of, we'll use that example, minus 1. Something like that, you're asking. What would be, what would be the region of convergence for that? We'll come back to that. Um, because for this one to converge, we saw that the magnitude of z is less than the magnitude of beta. For this one to converge, the magnitude of z must be greater than the magnitude of alpha. Kind of see the, what's happening here. There is a case where both of those can be satisfied simultaneously. Only if uh, ROC exists if, for this case, if, a big if, uh, the magnitude of alpha is less than the magnitude of beta. In that case, it would be, ROC would be magnitude of z greater than, less, I'm sorry, less than the magnitude of beta and greater than the magnitude of alpha. So this is a very interesting case. We'll come back to that. It doesn't hurt to go ahead a little bit. But, but this is a very interesting case where the region of convergence is actually a, a kind of a donut region, or not donut, but it's this annular region. So you get all kinds of cases. Now, if, if and this is interesting too, unlike the previous case where you had the sum of the two right-sided sequences, here's an interesting case where if, for instance, if, and this is the big if, if the magnitude of beta were less than the magnitude of alpha, there would be no way to, to, to satisfy this. So in that case where the magnitude, if magnitude of beta is less than magnitude of alpha, that would imply no ROC, no Z-transform, see? So very, very interesting, the Z-transform stuff, when you start looking at the regions of convergence. Anyway, I'll, I'll put that up there too. And, and, and I have... Like I said, I'll, I'll come back to that example. Uh, okay. Um, let's see what else I have. Oh, I see. We already went. Okay, already discussed that. And uh, let's see what else. Let's stay right. Okay. I tell you what. Why don't we take a break? Let's go out 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can't get back in that door. I know that. But I think you can get in that door. So, yeah. So I will see you at 8.15. And we will continue. Where the hell am I? Okay.
sitting here. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, no, I had to, I had to get another thing from people. So, um, I'll be on, I'll be on my, I'll be on my way right now. I, I need to get back to my room. Okay.
Anyway, okay. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of weird. Um, I received email. Um, most of you turned in your home. I'm still, maybe it's because I was looking at my several requests for Some of these could actually um, repeat. Well, no, no, no I'll, I'll try to make these a little more general. So let me provide some more examples. And, you know, as you go through these examples, you'll start to see kind of what's going on. You, you, you got the gist of what was happening with the left-sided plus right-sided. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of go through this, and then it'll be a little bit more easier. Let's talk about a general case where you have um, just a sum. We consider two. Now, let's look at a general case of right-sided sequences. So this is uh, more general. So x of z, that would imply that x of z is equal to and you see, you, from the uh, from the special case with just two inputs, I think you can see what's going to happen here. We're going to get this. Um, k equal one to n of um, a sub k over one minus alpha k z inverse, uh, or that's equal to summation k equal one to n. Uh, this is a little bit better form I like. a sub k times z over z minus alpha sub k. This example, we have n poles at z equal alpha sub k plus, in this case, there's, there's in, this, in this example, one zero. But this is a little more general than we showed before, but I think you see going to see what's going to happen. So um, if you were to plot, and we do this a lot with uh, z transforms, especially when we have rational functions of z, you plot the pole zero diagram. So you, what you do is you plot on one axis the imaginary part of z, on the other part the real part of z, and then plot the uh, poles. I always use x's for poles, the book does too. Um, yeah, so you, you might have poles here. These are again at alpha sub k, see? Those are the poles. And then, so x's are always denote poles in the pole zero diagram. And the uh, o's, so x's, x's are poles. And the little O's or zeros are the zeros. So the pole zero, this is the pole zero diagram. And you can see here, I mean, I, this is just arbit, I mean, I just made up something here, but, but you would typically plot the poles with X's and the zeros with the open circle or with the uh, little circle O or zero. And that would be the pole zero diagram. Now, given that these are the alphas of k, and given what we've learned before, then I ask you, what would be the extend it, extend the uh, reason of convergence from that very simple example? Remember what we found there from the simple example, the sum of two right-sided sequences. Or was it on? No, it was here. What we found for the simple example was that uh, here, the, the magnitude of z for the region of convergence is all points z in the complex plane such that the magnitude is greater than the maximum value of alpha or beta in the case where we had two, uh, two right-sided sequences. So for the general case, clearly, the region of convergence 
will be the set of z greater than the max of all the alphas of k's. You know, magnitude of alphas of k. That will be the region of convergence, just extending the simple example on. So if you draw all of your all of your x's, all of your poles, and then what you do is you, you pick the one that's the furthest, the magnitude that's furthest from the origin. Uh, let's Well, I've drawn pretty close, but let, let's say it was this one. Draw a circle with that radius. It's not quite to scale, but... Uh, and the region of convergence for right-sided sequence will be everything outside of that, see? And that will be, I'll call that alpha sub k max. You'll know what I mean by that. I just mean that's the alpha sub k with the largest absolute value. So the region of convergence will be everything outside of that circle. So you notice something that this one pole that has the largest absolute value, complex magnitude, this pole will lie on the boundary of the region of convergence, but it won't be in the region of convergence, because the region of convergence will be actually strictly greater than the magnitude of that pole. What about all the other poles, all these other guys here? None of them will lie in the region of convergence. As it turns out, the ROC cannot contain poles cannot make sense, right? Contain poles or any any, any singularity. Makes sense. Uh, if clearly if, if a pole was in the region of convergence, the Z transform would diverge at that particular point and uh, it wouldn't be the region of convergence. So the region of convergence is going to be nice and clean. It's got to be uh, free of any poles or anything like that. So for right-sided sequences, the only way we can avoid having poles in the region, this is another way to look at it, is by making the region of convergence the values of z whose magnitude of z are greater than the largest possible pole, and then everything outside of that. Okay, So that is, that's basically um, kind of a, a generalization of our sum of two uh, right-sided sequence example. So that is that case. Uh, let's see if I did another. And, I, and I'm telling you, when I do this, okay, when I do this, it'll make the rest of my notes simpler or more believable, I guess I should say. Okay, th these are some old notes I wrote, but I want to make sure I capture everything here. Oh, yes, I did do that. Okay, so that's right-sided sequence. We have the same type of deal for left-sided sequences. Um, three. So left-sided sequences, let's look at those. Okay, yes, yes, can sir. Can uh, the region of convergence can be include zeros? Um, yes, good. Yeah, zeros are fine. Doesn't care about zeros. They can be anywhere. Uh, it's just you know the poles. That that that's what we care about. Um, okay, how about the sum of the left sided? And I I didn't consider a sum of two left sided. I actually did consider a sum of left and right, but I didn't consider this case. But I think you can start to see what's going on. A sub k alpha to the sub k to the n. You have minus n. Now, you might say, like even for the right side, of the sequence, what if one of them had u of minus n minus k or something? Well, that, that's no problem. You just make the appropriate uh, Oh, well, and, yeah, OK. So, but, but still, even if, if I'm sorry, <laughs> even if there were, one of these sequences was delayed, instead of being u of minus n, I don't lose any generality in that because I'm still going to get these, the, uh, the z transform will, will be of the same form anyway. So the results I'm saying here will apply whether there's delays or not. But for, for simplicity, I'll assume there's no delays. They're all u of minus n for the time dependence and the alpha sub k to the n. And let's see what this looks like. n equals 0 to infinity. Because uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to take the Z transform 
And so that'll be a sum of z transforms, each of the form alpha to k to the n times u of minus n. And you kind of know how to, to, to do that. But I'm going to focus here on the, um, on the region of convergence. For the region of convergence, you have to have this condition to be satisfied, less than infinity. That sum from n equals 0 to infinity. Uh, uh, hopefully, I've, I've, yeah, I, I did do that correctly. You, need, you say, well, isn't it from minus, from zero to minus infinity? Yeah, it is. But what I did was I just flipped the ends. Okay, I just flipped the the sign of the n. So instead of z to the minus n times a sub k to the plus n, I just flipped the sign of the n. So this is equivalent for the uh, convergence. Okay, for left-sided sequences of this form. Okay, so what does that imply? Well, it implies that the Z transform converges if the magnitude of Z is less than the magnitude of alpha K for all K. So it's analogous to the previous case, except now, uh, and for this condition to hold for all K, what that implies is that the ROC this is a set of all z such the magnitude of z such that the magnitude is less than the minimum, the minimum of all of the uh, alpha sub k. Okay. So it's either greater than the max or less than the min in, in the case where it sums of left-sided or sums of right-sided sequences. So what this looks like, if we apply its pole zero diagram and show and overlay the region of convergence, what this implies is that, so here is alpha, here's our alpha one, alpha two, say, I don't know, just as many as you want, uh, alpha three, and maybe there's a little, ee, little bitty guy here, alpha four, etc. So what this is saying now is that, well, for left-sided sequences, our region of convergence will now be interior, interior to a circle with radius bounded by the smallest, by the smallest magnitude of the pole, okay? By the smallest alpha sub k, basically exponential. So here's the ROC, and if you, oh, I didn't mean here. And if you look in the ROC, Although you can't, I, I made it messy, I colored it in. But if, if you had x-ray eyes, you would see that there are no x's inside the, the region of convergence. They're only, this time, they're only on the outside. So that's what happens with left-sided sequences. Again, the ROC, so it's analogous to the right side, the sums are right-sided. It's the same type of thing. It's basically, you have a bunch of conditions to satisfy, namely this. And the only way you can satisfy all of them at once is by making, in this case, the magnitude of z has to be less than the minimum of all the alpha sub k. So you get this picture. So those are the two pictures for sums of left-sided, for sums of right-sided. Exterior, interior. Exterior, interior. And I can tell, I can still tell you by just looking at these regions of convergence. I haven't forgotten that I promised that, that you can tell if the sequence is stable or not or not stable. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a moment. So that is the story of sums of left-sided and right-sided sequences. Now, wait a minute, what is this? Uh, oh, okay, never mind. Okay, so we'll come back to that point. Uh, I'll show you some ways of generalizing that, but that's kind of the bottom line. Those two examples, you can kind of see what's happening. Okay, so we'll go back to our notes. An important class... Oh, okay, I see what I did. Okay, so that was uh, an aside, but it'll set us up, and it'll make the rest of the notes a little bit easier, based on the next page. Uh, before I... G uh, before I go back to the Z-transform, let me just point out something about the property. An important class of linear shift invariant systems have Z-transforms with rational functions of Z. We considered cases where, um, well, we, we considered, 
You know, I just thought of something. Just, just a minute, I just thought of this. Uh, you know what? <laughs> this is kind of interesting. I just realized this. I just said that when I did the Z-transform the right-sided, I wrote it out because we I already calculated what that was. It's a little bit different the left side, but you can do the same thing. Remember, I got this form, a sub kz divided by z minus alpha k, k equal 1 to n. Then I said there are n poles. Well, that's pretty true. And there's one zero at z equals 0. Of course, I just realized <laughs> That's, there are other zeros that, to get at the question you ask. Let's take, let's, jeez, uh, I'll have to write another page. But anyway, let's take an example. Um, okay, example n equals 2. And you can do the same type of example for left-sided. Let's say x of z is equal to, I don't know, a1z, or le le let's make it even simpler. Okay, it looks like this. Over z minus 2 plus z over z minus 3. So I'll take a simple example where the a's are all 1, and I have two poles at 2 and 3. So in this case, since it's RSS, the region of convergence would be all z greater than magnitude of z greater than 3. Okay, but look, here's what I want to do. Let me combine those together. You know the old common denominator trick. So that's going to be z over z minus 3. I just want to point this out. Plus, this is over z minus 2 times z minus 3, plus z times z minus 2. Okay, so really the numerator of z, what does it look like? It looks like, the denominator is this, that's fine. The numerator is z squared, in fact there will be two z squareds, minus 3z minus 2z, that's in my book a minus 5z, okay? And uh, I can write that as z times 2z minus 5. So there's one zero, it's equal zero, so I state, but there's another zero. Okay, so that's when you combine these systems together. So zeros at at z equals zero, and z and z equals uh, five halves, I guess. Five halves. Yeah, I, I forgot. I just just wanted to point that out. So even when you add these together, because I had indicated that, I'll. I'll I'll, I'll come back, back to that. I indicated there's one zero, and there's more than one zero, generally, because you have to, you know, combine these together. But there is a zero. <laughs> there is a zero plus a zero is equal zero plus more. And I'll, I'll include this example. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. So my boss at work asked me, have I seen them all? And I said, no, but I have seen one. So uh, for whatever, I, what does that have to do with this? Nothing. I, I, my mind is kind of breaks like that from time to time. So anyway, I just, I just realized I, was, I misled you a little bit into thinking there's only one zero. Of course, there's more than one zero when you combine the fractions. Anyway, um, anywho, sorry about that. Um, Anyway, back to the notes. An important class of LSI systems are systems whose x of z, z transform, are rational functions of z's. And we could see that's, um, well, what? That's uh, geometric sequences, sums of geometric sequences. We'll see, I think I'll just show you in a, well, no, a little bit later, linear difference equations. S uh, systems that have a linear difference equation representation all have these rational functions of z. Now, and and you can write them directly when you when you when we go through this, you'll see why the most natural form of these things are that look like this: powers of z inverse. Okay, they are powers of z inverse, and generally the z inverse 
The maximum inverse power of z can be m in, in the numerator and n in the denominator, most general form. This is an aside, but I just want to point this out. So x of z, this is a very, very general form, especially for uh, linear difference equations. So that's equal to b naught plus b1. I'm just rewriting this again because I want to show you something. Plus blah blah plus b sub m times z to the minus m. Same thing in the denominator. A naught. I prefer this as you'll see. This comes out naturally when you take z transforms of difference equations and so on, or even geometric sequences. But I just want to show you. Uh, plus a sub n, z to the minus n. I prefer, actually, to factor out the most negative powers of z in the numerator and denominator. So I will factor those out. And then you get all nice positive powers of z minus n. And in doing that, uh, b naught z to the plus m dot 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 plus uh, b1. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, all the way down. Well, all the way down to one, I guess, uh, or all the way down to dot 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 b sub m. Okay, just a con. And the same thing in in the denominator. A naught z to the plus n all the way down to plus a sub n. I prefer to write it like that because now you see that you have m zeros, you have n poles. Okay. In addition, what is this? I can write that as well. I can write it as z to the n minus m, right? Um, and this will be this will have either a pole, either have oh, I'm sorry, I should say either have multiple poles, poles or zeros at z equals 0. Obviously, it depends on if n is greater than m or if m is greater than n. If, if the power, if the inverse powers are, are, if there are more of them in the numerator than there are in the denominator, in other words, if m is greater than n, then this will be a, it'll have n poles, or n minus m poles at z equals 0. Vice versa, it'll have n minus m zeros. So in any case, that's just a kind of a useful way of um, of writing that, uh, which I will include in here. And um, in any who, we can factor, wait a minute, let me make sure I, I want to say this correctly. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm glad I did this because, uh, in any case, yes, we uh, we can keep it in this form with inverse powers of z, in which case we can factor it into its we can factor these polynomials into their basic roots, and come up with a bunch of of um, you know of, of roots like this k equal one to m one minus c sub k z inverse. We multiply those all out. We get the numerator and the same thing in the denominator. And here I'm assuming, assuming no multiple roots in the numerator or denominator, just for purposes of illustration. Now, what I like to do again is to do so. I can do this, or I can go back to my powers of z, uh, uh, plus powers of z. So I kind of like to do this, x of z. Uh, equals to k naught a constant times the product. Uh, I guess I want to do k equal one to m of one minus c sub k c inverse. Yeah, I I should have pointed out um, that they're they're actually to get this form. Uh, okay, obviously, um, yeah, uh, obviously, sorry, uh, obviously here there's b naught and a naught. In other words, if you write it in this form, you're going to get the constant term will always be, when you multiply all these out, 
there will be 1 and then plus some constant times z1 plus another constant times z the minus 2, etc., all the way up. Um, but your, your first term will be 1. Here it's, it's b0. But you can make this work if you, this will be the same as this, provided you multiply it here by constant, where the constant is equal to b0 over a0. Okay, so in other words, if I factor a b0 over a0, I get 1s. Uh, my leading term here will be 1 with the power of, well, with, with no power, inverse power of z. So I can factor b0 over a0 out, and I get 1 up there, 1 down there, okay? I, I mean, I get the leading term here, 1, I get the leading term, 1. And these constants will all be normalized by b0, and these will be all normalized by a0. So that's why you can write it like this. You do have to have this constant. Anyway, let me go a little step further here. If you look at this, I'm going to write it like this, which I haven't done anything. I know that yet. I just rewritten this, z inverse. Um, where again the k naught is would be b naught over a naught. But now what I want to do is like I just did. I want to factor out the powers of z, and when I do that, I will get z to the n minus m. You can see this from what I did before, but I will show it in factored form. Pi k equal one to m of uh, z minus c sub k divide it by pi i equal 1 to n of z minus d sub i. So basically what I'm doing is I'm factoring out the z inverses so that you now have positive powers. Why am I doing that? Who cares? Because the reason why I'm doing that is when you write it in this form, which falls out naturally when you work with the difference equations, as we'll see later, when you write it in this form in terms of inverse powers of z, you know, you, the, it's a little confusing because you don't know, well, wait, if z is 0, this thing blows up. So is, is this thing going to, if, if I go to z equals 0, there are going to be poles there, there are going to be zeros. Whereas if you factor out the inverse z here so that you make it all positive powers, then you can see what's going on. No, it, 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 has, it does indeed have these simple zeros at the z equals c sub k and simple poles at z equals d sub i. But there could be poles or zeros at z equals 0. So I don't know. I, I prefer, this is the form I prefer to write it in to see where the poles and zeros are. But anyway, uh, that's just a comment. Because we're going we're gonna to be, we'll, so help me, we'll be, a lot of our x of z's, most of them will be of this form, some form, for b and a. And that also merges nicely with MATLAB, so as I will talk about later on. So that's that. And now I actually, several more minutes, I actually am almost done, as it turns out. Um, here, properties of the rational Z transform. The region of a convergence cannot contain poles by definition. It turns out that poles typically bound the region of convergence, or one pole normally does, like in the examples I just showed you. The region of convergence is dependent on the type of sequence, whether it's left-sided, whether it's right-sided. You definitely saw that before. Or, or if it's double-sided. We saw that case. Remember, we worked out that case where we got, we found that the region of convergence was actually an annular region. That was when the x of n was the sum of right-sided plus left-sided, i.e. a double-sided sequence. So the region of convergence depend on those types of sequences. You can generally characterize or classify the region of convergence for sequences, as definitely geometric sequences, in terms of left-handed left sequence. That's region of convergence is inside a unit circle. Right-sided sequence, the region of convergence is outside, or a double-sided, in general, it may not exist, but if it does, it'll typically between, be an annular region. The region of convergence for a right-sided sequence is bounded by the magnitude of the pole furthest from the origin. 
and that we covered in those examples. This is, I, I put another way of proving that. But anyway, this is, this is the case we talked about before where we had a sum of right-sided geometric sequences, and this was the ROC we derived. The ROC was everything exterior to a circle whose radius is the largest magnitude pole from the origin. Zeros, we don't care about. In fact, in that example, well, that's all right. I, go back to that. But zeros, we can have zeros in here. We don't care. We just care about the singularities, the poles, okay? And here's another proof of that. I did it one way. Here you can prove it this way. To prove this, let's first prove the following lemma. This is a little bit more rigorous, but the, the, uh, the method of proof, but, but the result is, well, the result's the same. And also, if you really carefully look at what I did here, it's, it's in agreement with what I was doing before. So it's, it's just a different way to look at it. I think it's a little bit more rigorous, but maybe not really so much. So anyway, but you can, you can take a look at that. But the, the, the example we went through before kind of told you the story. Um, anyway, that's just proving that. For... Well, I don't know if I have. Yeah, never mind. Um, for left-sided sequences, the region of convergence we talked about before. Whoops, where am I? The region of convergence is everything interior to a circle with radius equal to the, to the magnitude of the pole with the, the smallest magnitude. Um, and, uh, and for double-sided sequences, the region of convergence is generally a circular bounded by two adjacent poles, if, if in fact it even exists. And I talked about those examples before. So that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Now what's interesting, what would be interesting, here would be another example. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, X of N is equal to see if I can do this right. Let's take a divergent sequence times u of n. Let me do another sequence, a 0 0.5, another right-sided sequence. And then, what the hell, I'm going to add in, uh, let's see. Um, Uh, let's see, let's see, 0.25 is going to be less than that. Uh, yeah, I guess we could do that. 0 0.25 times u minus n. Now that's kind of an interesting one. Um, that has actually three possibilities. Uh, that ROC could be, uh, a, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I have to come back to that one later on. <laughs> I'm starting to get a little too, <laughs> going a little bit too quick here. So I'll, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, or better yet, you think about that one. <laughs> I mean, I, it's a simple one to do. But I'll probably mess it up, and it may not be the example I was exactly looking for. So anyway, I'll, I'll let you, or, or I'll talk about it next time. Anyway, and I have some examples at the end of this. So those are the general types of region of convergence you can have for Z transforms with rational functions of Z behavior, or for geometric se sequences, or for difference equations. I'll point that out a little bit later. Um, so that's, those are the three general classes of regions of convergence you can have. These are some additional properties of the Z-transform. Um, linearity. Uh, this is an, uh, no surprise in this property. If, if you have a sequence which is a sum of two sequences, then the, then the Z transform will be the sum of the Z transform since it's linear. Done. Eh, eh, 
eh, eh, not quite yet done, almost, but not quite. What about the region of convergence? What can you say about that? When you have a sum of two sequences, that's easy to write, W of Z, but what about the region of convergence? Well, as we will see later, in general, the region of convergence is equal to the intersection of the region of convergence of x and the region of convergence of y. Okay, Generally, that's true, just like that first case we consider with the sum of two right-sided sequences. Or the case where we looked at a right-sided plus a left-sided. We showed there that the region of convergence, depending on the, the parameters, alpha and beta, were an were a, uh, annular region. Because one was less than, the other was greater than, and we took the intersection, or, or when we found the region of convergence, for which both those sequences, the left and the right, converged absolutely, it was actually, if you look at it carefully, it was the intersection of two regions of convergence. But there is an exception to this case. This is generally true, but sometimes actually you can find or the region of convergence could be actually everything. I'll write that as the entire complex plane. How in the world could that happen? Let me give you an example. Suppose that x of n, suppose x of n were equal to delta of n minus u of n, and suppose y of n was equal to minus u of n. What about that case? Well, you can you can clearly see what's happening. If you I mean add those two together, x and y, the u's cancel. See, or, or I'm sorry, maybe that's uh, plus here. Delta of n plus u of n, and y of n is minus u of n. You can see what's happening. The u of n's cancel out, and you're just left with the sum being delta of n, which has a z transform of 1, which every, everywhere is the region of convergence. Let's look at it at, in the uh, z transform domain. OK, x of n is delta of n plus u of n. Here is the z transform of that. What is its region of convergence? ROC is the set of, of magnitude z strictly greater than 1. OK. How about y of z in the z domain? That's minus 1 over 1 minus z. The region of convergence is once again z greater than 1, see? So if you would take the intersection, you would say, well, the region of convergence of the sum would be magnitude of z greater than 1, exterior to that circle. But it turns out, because of pole, because of these cancellations of the poles, in fact, the region of convergence is everywhere. X of n is delta of n. Everywhere is the region of convergence. So the ROC is a little bit tricky if you get this pole 0 or this pole cancellation. But that aside, it's generally the intersection. Uh, delay, again, very simple. As it turns out, if W of n is, is X of n minus n naught, then, as it turns out, W of z is equal to z to the minus n naught times x of z. It's kind of like just like it was for the DTFT when we introduced a time shift. We got e to the minus j omega n or k times DTFT. Well, here it's it's instead of e to the minus, it's z. Okay, so that's no surprise. Now, what about the region of convergence? Well, the, in this case, the region of convergence of W, the delayed version, is the same as the region of convergence. See, these regions of convergence, you've got to, got to keep track, is the same as the region of convergence of X, except possibly, well, I'm just repeating what I wrote, except possibly at Z equals 0. Okay and z equals 0. What do I mean by that? Well, if, for instance, n naught were positive, OK, then you know, you're going to add some uh, poles here at z equals 0. And you, you want to exclude those poles. Of course, on this case, the pole is just one dot. You know, but, but you still want to in, in exclude that. If, on the other hand, n naught is less than 0, then you have z to some positive power. And it, then it just has zeros at n equals 0. So possibly at z equals 0, 
depending on the sine of n naught. Same thing at z as you let z go to infinity. As you let z go to infinity, if you noticed, uh, and I didn't point this out, but when you go back and you take a look at this z transform, if you look at it for a minute, you'll see that as z goes to infinity, this is perfectly well defined. Everything's great because all of these terms go to zero, all these terms go to zero. So this, and I didn't point this out, but I will, goes to, as z goes to infinity, it goes to b naught over a naught. So actually you could say, you know, there really are no, everything's well behaved as z goes to infinity. And you would like to be able to say that, so that that's for that, you'd like to be able to say that when you have a simple delay, but you can't necessarily. Because if n naught were negative, that would be z to the plus n naught, this thing could blow up. So, you know, it's just a little bit tricky. But generally, yes, the regions of convergence are the same except at zero or this infinity thing. Um, convolution, same type of deal. Again, when you convolve, the z transforms, the product of the z transforms, that's, that's for sure. The region of convergence, again, generally it's going to be the intersection. Now, you could have a situation, you could have a situation where the intersection is empty, okay? Where the intersection is empty. You've got to check out for that. In all these cases, you could have that. In which case, you know what? C transform doesn't exist. Have to have a region of convergence, which is non empty, for the, uh, for the Z transform to exist. You also could have another situation where you get what I would call pole zero cancellation. Suppose y of z is equal to, um, I don't know, 1 minus z inverse. Here, the region of convergence is everything greater than zero. And let's say x of z is equal to, well, 1 over 1 minus z inverse. Here, the region of convergence is z greater than 1. Okay, it's, I'm assuming these are right-sided sequences. Now, when I multiply them together, when I do this convolution, you will notice that x times y is equal to 1. Because what happened was the 0 here was canceled by the pole down here. And now, the, everything, z equal the entire complex plane work. So in this case, uh, w, uh, the region of convergence of w is actually uh, you know, is, is greater than the region of convergence of x or y because of pole zero cancellation. So there are some special cases. But generally, yes, it is the intersection again. Um, so these are just properties for, like we had with the DTFT Parseval's relationship, you have a similar relationship. In fact, it turns out you have the same relationship with the Z transform. Um, out here. Initial value theorem. I think I'm almost out, close to being out of time. Initial value theorem. This is a very exotic looking theorem, but it's actually trivial. For a, I mean, trivial to prove. For a causal sequence, okay, what is a causal sequence? A causal sequence is zero for n less than zero. Okay, for a causal sequence, this is very interesting. Then it turns out that, um, x of 0, the initial value, in other words, if, if you have a x of, capital X of z, it's very complicated looking, so you couldn't readily compute x of n. But if you have x of z um, in some form, like we did over there back, you know, in that, in that form I had before, this guy here, you know. So you have x of z here. If I ask you, what is x? little x of n. What is the sequence? Well, it's kind of a mess because you've got to inverse z transform this whole thing. What if I ask you, okay, for this, I told you that x of n is causal, and I want to know what x little x of 0 is, see? What is x of 0 here for this case? Well, it turns out, and you can, you can try this. You can do it in MATLAB. Little x of 0 is equal to b naught over a naught. Take that one to the bank. That is definitely the case. Why is that the case? Okay. What 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 is that? What's going on here? All right. Well, it's very simple. So for a causal 
uh, sequence, then if you have x of z, you let z go to infinity, and you can determine what the first value in that sequence is. Why is this? Well, because what is x of z if the sequence is causal? It looks like this. n equals 0 to infinity, x of n times z to the minus n. Get it? Get it? x of 0 plus x of 1, z to the minus 1 plus dot, dot, dot. Let z go to infinity. All those terms go away. See? Goes to x of 0 as z goes to infinity. Pretty cool. What that does is it lets you evaluate the first few points of sequences that are very, very complicated. It lets you do that analytically, like just that what I just said. Okay? It's a very, very useful theorem. And you can extend, you can generalize the theorem. In other words, if you looked at look at at x of z. Uh, minus little x of 0, see? Look at that. Okay? Multiply that by, by z. L look at this. What is that equal to? Well, that's going to be x of 1 plus x of 2 times z to the minus 1, dot, dot, dot. So if you look at the limit, and if z goes to infinity, uh, I think this is correct. Double check me. Don't take anything I say. Always verify. Uh, zero, that goes to x of 1. So these, these are, this is very, if it's causal, very, very useful theorem if you just want to know the first couple of values of the sequence without going through MATLAB or anything else. Very, very, uh, very useful little result. Uh, so those are some of the properties. Um, those, those properties permit us to develop alternative conditions for causality and stability. Now, I will talk about those next time. This is getting at what I promised, namely that by looking at this, I can tell you if the sequence is causal, if it's stable. I can tell you all kinds of things. Well, already we know that right-sided we know that. Right-sided means the region of convergence is exterior, so you can tell if it's right-sided or left-sided pretty quickly. But I can also tell if it's stable. I can tell if a right-sided sequence is stable by looking at the pole zero plots. Okay, So I, we'll save that for next time. So anyway, uh, that's it. If there's any more homeworks, I think that's quite a few. Now, by the way, I do want to make this announcement. Be on the lookout. I will post a homework that's once again due in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll post that up there in the next day or two. So keep an eye out for that. And also, I'm going to post pretty soon, probably this by the weekend, maybe early next week, the first project. So keep an eye on that. And you will need MATLAB for that. So for those of you who are just coming, getting your the software together, um, you will have a chance to use it in the first project. So I will see you all next week. Have a good week. This concludes EE 483 on Wednesday, June 4th, 2004.